Okay, so sorry for jumping the queue, but I thought now would be a good time to sort of go over all of the database architecture since at least the a, a fairly solid outline of what we want to have and uh, is there and most of it is implemented actually. So we'll talk through what is implemented in this uh, discussion here. Uh, and Matthias is just going to come in and correct me whenever I say anything that's a load of bollocks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how we, we've structured this. So, okay. So starting from the top, uh, let's see, there we go. So I'm going to give a, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, we're going to start with the sort of bottom up of the architecture. So we're going to start at the lowest level and then we're going to kind of work our way up to the overarching design of uh, the Terminus database. Then we're going to talk about some of the operations that are enabled by that architecture. And then I'm going to give a top-down view, which where we're just going to look at the whole thing from 30,000 feet. OK. Um, hopefully, we won't be too, too uh, slow. So quickly, we need to recap store. So we have an underlying Rust library uh, called Terminus Store, which implements the lowest level storage layer uh, and gives us access to the information that's in uh, Terminus Store. It implements the Delta encoded append only succinct data structures. So it's a little bit of a mouthful there. So our fundamental architecture is based on Delta encoding. So that means we, we represent all of the additions and all of the subtractions that occur in some transaction. And then we use that to give ourselves the current state of uh, the graph using that those deltas in a similar way that Git does. Uh, they're append only. We only add things to it. Uh, so we never are altering the past structure of the database. Now there's some details about that that we're going to have uh, um, we're going to have delta rollups where you have like a collapsed layer that represents a series, a chain in the series. But that doesn't delete anything. All it does is another append, it's a, an additional append. And there are succinct data structures. And the technical, I, I've said this a few times, but technically, a succinct data structure is a data structure that uh, approaches the information theoretic minimum size possible for the representation of something. Uh, so that there's some advantages that we get out of. Out no, of it's 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 actually not quite uh, the theoretical minimum. It's like the minimum while still being able to query this quickly. Like minimum would be like you compress to the maximum extent, and then if you want to do anything with it, you have to decompress first before you can do anything with it. That's These right. These succinct data structures they are about. Uh, yes, being small while still being searchable, basically. Right. Well, yeah. it's it's the 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 information theoretic minimum size given what the data structures algebraic properties are. So there's some kind of like, you want to be able to do some kind of operation in O n time or, or some, some operation has, mm -hmm. has uh, requirements on the searchability of it. So yeah, that's a, a good uh, clarification there. So, so, we're, um, so we're unlikely to be beaten on the, uh, on the compression factor of our like O log n, uh, properties of indexing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you can always you can always make it smaller by, you know, spending a lot of time compressing it into some format that's not searchable. Exactly. That's exactly. But, but it just I mean, it's a good thing uh, like uh, theoretical limits on searchable or indexable forms are, you know, it means, you know, there's never in the, ever in the future is that going to be a, a source of competition for us. We're never going to lose in that one. There could, yeah, be a new, well, there could be a new theory. Not yeah. information theory, no. <laughs> it's kind of basic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we lose some of these properties right here. So uh, yeah. th that because we're doing, OK, so whenever we do an update, some sort of transactional update, we add a new layer. And this layer has both a positive Wait, actually, and negative Actually, uh, one, one sec. Are you looking now at the slide with the layers? Because we are all still on the outline here. <gasps> oh. I see different things on my screen. Sorry about that. Ah, okay. Are you looking at the full screen view? Because maybe yeah, we're just we're looking at, at the window. we're looking at your desktop view, Gavin, and you're looking oh, at the full screen the view. Google Documents oh. interface. <laughs> okay, so let me um, stop share, and I'll just uh, I shared the wrong window. So Should I need to I need to do a, a present view first, and then share yes. that. I think. Um, sorry about that, folks. 
We yeah. need something like Git, but for presentations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. I'm still looking at you, though. No. What are you you're looking at? The wrong thing. Still. We're, we're seeing your uh, video. Your you. face. Yep. Christ. Yeah. We're not, you're not sharing. The hell. I have to hold up a mirror Sorry so we can that. see the uh, slides. Share. There we go. Beautiful. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. That's better. Now, yeah, now we see the layers. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So this this represents both negative and positive planes. So the negative plane represents everything that you've deleted from the previous version, and the positive plane are all the things that you have added. And each of these these uh, layers is quite is a succinct data structure, but we're we're putting them in a chain. And that, that sort of defeats some of the properties of the succinct data structure. And we can recover them by adding those uh, delta rollups where we, we get back all of the nice properties of the succinct data structure. But at the moment, there's also an ON cost to falling down through the layers where N is the number of layers. But hopefully, those number of layers are uh, you know, manageably small. And if not, then you, you really do need a delta rollup. So that's why high levels of transactions, if you have a huge number of transactions, then uh, the database will slow down a lot. Whereas if you have a very large transaction where you write a lot of things into a single layer, that's actually better for our performance on our system. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And uh, so head here means this is where we start. So when we're talking about a graph, we start at head and then we search back down through uh, the, the layers starting from head. Yeah. Head tells us what our current point is. And when we do a new transaction, we advance head to the new layer after that layer has been written. Yeah. And that's what and gives us transactionality. Yeah, Robin? Yeah. Um, each layer also uh, contains a reference to its parent, right? That's right. So each yeah. of these layers actually ha knows about what its parent is and points back to it. OK. So. Labels. Okay, so there's another complication here, which is a thing called a label, and they're a file which points into a given layer. So they give us a named entry point to some graph. So it's a, basically a graph name that we can use, and that allows us to have a starting point uh, where we uh, are looking in, and it's the way that we advance the head. So it's uh, for, for our, our top level idea of how to manage the layers, that's, that's how we advance the head. And they can be uh, updated in a safe manner because you can do file locking on the file in which you update the head. Uh, and the layers, since they're append only, it doesn't matter. There, there's no safety issue there. You can just write whatever layers you like. And they can point back to a parent. You can have multiple different layers pointing at the same parent. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you manage the update of where head is. So that's the only place where there's contention. OK. So why is this not enough as a structure? Well, this, is, this was our original implementation. Um, and there are, it's still how we implement everything, but there's, a, there's a, an additional fold. So uh, the reason it's not enough is because we need to orchestrate changes to multiple graphs simultaneously in a transactional way. Uh, so we need to move them all in concert. So we'll have a bunch of graphs. We have some transaction, and we want them all to move forward in a lump all at once. And you can't do that with individual labels because you are, you're updating different labels. There's race conditions. Things can go wrong. Uh, and we specifically need it because we need the instance graph and the schema graph to update simultaneously because our instance graph is supposed to always exist in a state in which the schema allows it to pass with the schema updated as well. So you might need to, if you lift the schema, you might also need to lift the instance data to change it in some way. For instance, if I add some cardinality on a property and that property has been used, uh, let's say we add a, a cardinality of one on some property uh, and say that you can only have one of these properties, say name. So you, you're only allowed to have one name. But there's a bunch of things in the instance data that implement multiple names. Well, you're going to have to also simultaneously move the instance graph to one where you delete all the duplicate names, or you delete all the uh, variations so that you only have one. And that has to happen in lockstep. So um, the other thing we need is we need metadata about these updates. So a commit history, some kind of information about 
timestamps, authors, messages, and we need to keep track of all of these things as well. So that doesn't happen right now in the layer store, just with the layers and labels. And the, the last thing is we want to be able to have branches. So we can have tags, uh, branches, tags, um, and they all need to point at collections of graphs, not just graphs, but collections of graphs, because they have a notion of instance and schema and potentially inference graph as well. Okay, so the generic solution, which is due to Matthias, is a very uh, brilliant plan, is to point at a layer from another layer. Okay, so that this is the basic idea behind uh, our major change, which has enabled all of these Git-like features with transactionality. So what what do we do? We we point at we we actually represent um, which layers we're talking about inside of a graph itself. So we have a graph that points to the layers that we're talking about, and then we build up a hierarchy of these these uh, these layers. <laughs> And then we move the label of the top layer when everything is complete. When we've done all of the modifications that we're interested in, then we advance one head. And that single head then shifts our entire view of the database so that we can have a transactional update over a whole collection of graphs. OK, so how does this work? OK, so this is the basic uh, image. This shows us the layer store with a database label. So we have a database, it's called MyDB label. It's, it's a, for MyDB and we point in at a layer. So this guy here, it represents these sort of uh, angled boxes or layers and each layer points to its parent through some sort of sequence of things. And inside of those layers is a pointer to another layer. Okay, and we can see here that um, we've done a transaction. We've added a new, uh, uh, a new layer in my graph of graphs, and it now points to a uh, to a child of this um, of this previous layer. So we advance not only the graph of graphs, but the graphs also get advanced as well. Okay, so uh, clear as mud. Is that all <laughs> transparent or what? Okay. So if there's any questions, just uh, holler, because I uh, this is a little bit meta. So. so welcome to the commit graph. This is how we implement the commit graph. The first level of the hierarchy in our plan of graph domination. We're going to make these graphs do what we tell them to do. So the commit graph, uh, why a commit graph? Well, we want to have commits, collections of graphs with a known state satisfying known properties. Those properties in our case are usually that the instance graph meets the schema graph uh, specification and that the schema graph is sound in some notion of sound, like it doesn't uh, implement something nonsensical. Uh, we want the history of these graphs, uh, these graph collections. So we wanna watch how these graph collections move over time. And then we want some metadata, the timestamp, when it happened, the author, that, that kind of thing. Okay, so what's in a commit graph? Well, we have commit objects. So all of our objects are represented as graphs themselves, of course. Uh, with, so a commit object is um, a typed owl class that has an author, a message, and a timestamp. They uh, point at named graphs. Okay, so uh, a commit object has a number of different kind of named graphs that are associated with it. They can be instance graphs, schema graphs, or inference graphs. And these graphs all have a name, which is why they're called name graphs. So they're another object in the graph of the commit graph. And each of these name graphs points to uh, a layer reference object. And these, uh, these layer reference objects in turn point at a layer identifier. That layer identifier allows us to look up which layer we're talking about in the actual layer store. Uh, Gavin, just a question. Um, <clears throat> so the layer references that you can read from the commits, uh, uh, they are, from a user point of view, they're, they're completely, uh, you can't do anything with them. They're, they're just, you, the, the, the API for layer access is currently um, internal only. Is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah, so those layer identifiers 
are opaque identifiers to the user. But yeah, they are and th this is because the... this is because we're at the top of the hierarchy, and, and this is kind of a, a metadata representation of very complicated stuff that's going on beneath, uh, which I think is is brilliant. I think it's a great design because you can actually everything you know you can do everything you need to do in the commit graph without knowing anything about uh, layers at all. However, uh, which which I think is a great idea, you know, and it, it works really simple, but. Um, but but actually going against that, and I shouldn't be going against that because I agree with it. But but it, at some stage it'd be nice to be able to because we can kind of uh, time travel query uh, against two. I uh, have two different heads and you know do a manual uh, diff in um, in Wackle just by saying what triples are here and they're not there. It's pretty easy. But uh, at some stage in the at, at some stage in the future, I I, I assume. Uh, people will want to uh, be able to have better ways of looking inside specific diffs. So, <clears throat> anyway. Yeah, so in internally, actually, we, we have uh, ways to query individual layers. Uh, it's pretty much wired up in the entire system, except that we have no way uh, to describe this resource as a string. So you're yeah. basically just not able to address them. Yeah, if we yeah. add ability to address these, then you will be able to query them. That's a relatively mm. small change, which we could do it any time, I guess. Yeah, no, I don't think it, it, it's short term because uh, 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 we absolutely don't need it, especially in the short term for new users. But it's it's a thing uh, I can see uh, people, you know, we do have so much good information about deltas encoded in a delta format that I, I assume we're going to be able to use that uh, once we, when, whenever we do decide to open up that we'll be able to do some really cool shit when it comes to like automatically telling you what the difference is between stuff. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, as Matthias said, it's it's really, it's already there in the back end. It's just a question of exposing it with an interface with the named resource uh, addressing scheme. So, okay, so uh, branches are also in the commit graph and a branch is a very simple object. It just has a name and points to uh, one of these um, one of these uh, commit objects. Eventually, we can have tags go here too. We don't have tags as an object currently, but it's pretty straightforward to add it. So um, prefix definitions also go here in the commit graph. And the reason for that is, uh, well, I'll, get, I'll talk about that in a bit. And we should probably have a little bit of a conversation about it because prefixes are surprisingly difficult. One of the, you know, one of those, uh, very hard problems. The two hard problems in computer science is uh, naming things. Okay, so here's a picture of the commit graph, uh, what it looks like schematically. The red boxes are branches. They point at a commit. Uh, here we have dev and master. Each of the commits in turn points at a named graph. Here you see there's an instance graph called main, uh, a schema graph called main, and uh, each commit is pointing to those different things. I didn't represent every single one of them. Each of them actually has one of those pointers. Uh, you have each commit points to its parent. And then, of course, each of these commits has information like author, uh, timestamp, etc. So that's a basic schematic of the commit graph and what it looks like. Okay. So, so we, we call it every graph main there. And main is kind of the uh, default name for graphs. Uh, generally, like a simple case is you only need one instance graph, or you, like you need an instance and a schema graph. And then main makes sense as a name. But uh, there are instances where you will need multiple of these. Uh, so that's why, they're main, that's why they're named graphs, because there could actually be other names besides name. That's right. And that gives you an, in, uh, an a, uh, addressing scheme so you can use we do have a scheme for naming for talking about named graphs at the moment so it's a good way to uh, to communicate to people that they can make other ones as well by calling it main it's a good name that's right so we can we can add mm -hmm. as many as we like so the commit graph is also itself a validated graph it has a schema in fact it has two schemas the, so it doesn't just have a main schema, it actually has two schemas and they, it takes the union of the two and checks the commit graph against the union. Uh, so all of the instance data that we write into there is, uh, should be transactionally correct according to that schema. And we could relax this later. There are some, I mean, it reduces the performance to some extent, but I think um, it's actually really nice to have. And 
we have caught several errors from trying to write nonsense into the commit graph on accident uh, uh, in the back end. Okay, so uh, the commit graph is sufficient to implement branch, merge, rebase, tagging, reset, revert. So all of these operations are already possible with just the commit graph. So it's a very powerful abstraction uh, and it's quite cool. And all of the operations that we do, all of these operations, branch, rebase, uh, we don't have, so currently we have implemented branch and rebase. We have not implemented merge, tagging, reset, and revert, but th they will all be implementable in, in a similar fashion. But we implement them using walk queries because it is just a graph. So uh, this is just incredible levels of meta circularity. I mean, we, we're using Wackel to store information about the, the movement of the transactions themselves, and we're using Wackel to manipulate them. <laughs> uh, I just, I love it. So, you know, I feel like a level 32 Lambda cleric when I'm doing this. So the, <laughs> we're, we're up there with the- We also use Wackel- Self-compiling uh, compilers. We also use Wackel to build out the full uh, user library interface to uh, query the commit graph. That was the thing we did this, we were talking about this morning. So all the way through, all the way up to the pixels in the, uh, in the tables and the graphs, there's Wackel has, has taken everything. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, we're, we're super meta here. Meta, yeah. meta. Yes, Robin? Uh, one uh, thing to add: it could be, uh, it would be cool if later on uh, people could expand the commit graph themselves with uh, extra information uh, or the like. Yeah, so I imagine that this will eventually occur. So uh, we, yeah. we'll see. But the you, you can ex extend the schema uh, for the commit graph. Uh, those schemas are currently only compiled when the database is initially constructed. You could imagine a scenario in which we update them, but I don't have any defined code pathway for doing so. So yeah. the, the, current, the current advice uh, that I think we should make to people is, uh, this is turned off by default, it's only an internal graph, it's, it's read only from the outside. If you do want it, you can do it through this configuration thing. And it's completely un unsupported forevermore because we have no fucking clue what happens if you write that yeah. graph. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then, we have to go up another meta level to the metadata graph. So we don't get to just stick at the one level of meta. We have to go to two. So the metadata graph, why? Uh, collaboration, that's why. So we got all those other features, but we didn't get the collaboration features with that. So uh, the metadata graph is actually very simple. There's not very much in it. It, uh, it contains repository objects. The repository objects, they're either remote objects that have information about a URL from which we can obtain the remote uh, and local, uh, a local object currently, we only have one, but it, it's possible you may have more than one local object. And both of these types point to a commit graph. So this has the address, the layer ID of the commit graph that we're currently working with. So we can see what the head is of the commit graph. So that's how we advance the histories. Uh, we, we update the commit graph, we make a new layer, and then we advance the, his, the, the, the head in the metadata graph. And that's where we see the, the head moving on all of those. Okay, and, and this allows us to have remotes and locals and advance, uh, and advance the head of local. Okay, so this gives us more operations. So then we get the collaboration operations. Those are clone. Uh, push and pull currently. Those are the ones we have implemented clone and push. I think we've implemented pull, but we haven't tested it. <laughs> so I think we're nearly there on the uh, the sort of basic structure of what's necessary for a git, like uh, d uh, git for data. The, oper the, the operations are implemented essentially by transmitting uh, layers around. So we, we actually take the layers, we roll them up and send them across the wire to, to the other terminus DB. And this metadata graph is actually a top level graph that has a label. So we actually have a label, it's a file label where you do the file locking on it and it points in at this, okay? Uh, so this is the top of our hierarchy in a sense. Uh, and I'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so clone. 
How does clone work? Well, clone asks for the entire commit graph of a repository from the remote. So it contacts the remote at the URL that you've specified. Uh, it asks it for the commit graph that it, it knows. Uh, and then all of the transitive closure of all the references of the commit graph. Okay, so every layer referred to in the commit graph, as well as the commit graph, and all of the parents of the commit graph, and all of those layers as well. So say it packs them all up into a, a, a tar GZ at the moment, <laughs> is how it's implemented, along with the, an ID. And that ID is the head that, we, uh, that allows us to get into this um, commit graph. We then unpack it locally once uh, the remote has sent it to us. Uh, we validate it actually before completely unpacking it. We look in, make sure that all of those layer references are reasonable. And then we uh, spit it out into the layer store. Then we add the repository object to our met metadata graph uh, saying, oh, we now have a remote. This is a remote, here's its head. Uh, and then we set up the master branch in our local to be the same as whatever we got. So then we, we kind of copy over the information from that remote's head into our own local commit graph. And then we advance the metadata graph head for the entire thing so that we have a new metadata graph that now points at a remote and all of the layer IDs in there are updated and all, all of the appropriate layer IDs are now correct in the commit graph. So we now have all the data and all the history and we have it in our local database. Okay, so push um, turned out to be a lot more complicated than, <laughs> than we had thought. So we thought we were gonna implement it in an afternoon. And I think it, what did, what did it take us, Matthias? I think uh, one to two weeks. Yeah, one to two weeks. Yeah, maybe on the outer end of that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it took a while. So we build what we think is the remote should look like uh, with our local changes for a push. So what we do is we look, um, we look locally at our remotes repository uh, and see what we think uh, we have added. And then uh, we pack up all of the things that we think the remote's gonna need to know about into uh, a tarball. And then we send it to the remote. The remote unpacks it, checks to make sure it's uh, sensible, uh, that it's a fast forward only. So it's possible somebody came in and pushed before us and advanced the head there, in which case we'll get an error here because we've tried to push something that we didn't know about what the state of the remote was. Uh, but imagining it's a fast forward only, then we update the metadata graph and uh, we report success and everything is good. Then the local updates its metadata graph when it gets the response of success back from the remote. And so we, we advance in a sort of a lockstep operation. Okay, so pull. Pull uh, is, we've only, uh, we haven't tested it yet. So I think this is how it works, <laughs> but I uh, wouldn't- We uh, certainly hope so. Yeah, we hope this is how it works. So we ask the commit graph, um, of a, for a repository head that we know. Uh, that's packed up as a TGZ of layers uh, with the layer ID of the head that we want. Um, and then we take it, we unpack it locally, and then we advance the metadata graph head, uh, and then we advance the branch we're, we're pulling. Uh, so, we take, so we've taken their remote, we have a local copy of their remote history, and then we need to figure out how to advance the history in our local so that it mirrors the kinds of information that is in the uh, remote. So that, that might, you know, there's a number of things that could happen there. It could be a fast forward, you might have, have to do a rebase. Ultimately, we'd like to be able to do merge, three-way merge as a possible operation to uh, reconcile the, the two uh, versions of history. So maybe uh, one more thing about uh, the unpacking. So uh, we try to be a bit clever about it. So it's not basically just uh, untarring uh, a big collection into a store without uh, actually checking. Uh, we actually check what we have locally uh, and we make sure that just those things are extracted that we actually need. So that we never actually override the layer that we already had. 
uh, because that, that could potentially be quite unsafe because then you've got some layer which is supposed to be read only, but actually you're now overriding it. Uh, so that, that kind of thing, we try to avoid that. Uh, there's more validation that should go into this though. So uh, we are still quite working on this to make this really safe as well. Uh, just to make sure that uh, nobody gets up to any kind of nefarious things with overriding each other's layers and things like that. Uh, so yeah, there's still quite a bit of work in that as well. That's yeah, it. So. Uh, interesting, actually. I mean, there's a whole new uh, vector of potential attacks when you can <laughs> That's right. destroy people's uh, remotely destroy people's database history. It's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it would be interesting to me to see to know if there's any uh, if there's any uh, actually in the wild incidents of this happening with Git. I mean, software is, is you know, well, Git, Git is a bit nicer, right? Because Git actually hashes all the changes. So you can't just yeah. say, well, my, my Git commit is called such and such, uh, yeah. because it actually needs to be a valid hash of whatever's in there. Yeah. And unfortunately, right now we don't hash, we actually just assign a random ID. So yeah. that's actually also part of it. We very much want to make these proper hashes. Yeah, of the yeah, actual yeah. content, yeah, yeah, yeah. then it's also a lot safer than it is right yeah, now. No, no, no. I was, I was, no. that was my follow-up question I was going to ask. Was that, was that the uh, <laughs> hashing of, yeah, yeah, because that's, that's a great solution for it. In yeah, a lot that of ways. makes it very hard to fake what the data, like right now you can just name the layer anything you like and you can then overwrite somebody else's layer. But if it was yeah, a hash, so. you couldn't do that. You well, can you, can't, you can't overwrite yeah, someone else's layer, but you right? could potentially like, uh, like assume someone is going to pull something later and then you can quickly push like another layer with the same name and then be sure that that never gets overwritten. Yeah. So there's factors there. It's, it's, you could also, uh, it's you a could bit also, annoying. You could, also in, you could also include the hash of the previous layer in the, uh, in the, current, in the current layer and have a bit of a hash chain. So you have- Yes, a, definitely. Like that should be a hash chain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's very secure then. Yeah, so things to work on. Uh, to work on. Yeah. <laughs> we have we have no uh, shortage of things to work on. No sleep but for I, us. Yeah, no sleep <laughs> for us. It's it's very exciting though. I'm I, I'm looking forward to that change when we're able to make it. Well, it sounds like it's like uh, uh, you know could be sooner rather than later. I mean, I know there's a bunch of cleanup stuff to do, but once we have the basic push pull, uh, that would kind of like be the next layer of evolution for the database itself. Yeah, unfortunately, we have a lot of next layers of evolution. I mean, that is a very critical one, and I think it's very high up on the chain uh, in terms of importance. But there's also uh, the typed storage, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lexical sorting of typed storage, delta and roll -up. delta rollups. And delta rollups will become very important. Um, yeah, and I'll and get also, to that in a minute. And also, uh, 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 undemoned operations so we can do more pipeline -y kind of stuff without a server running yeah that would be cool yeah and uh yeah garbage collection it's the other thing garbage collection, yes <laughs> yeah so lots lots to be lots done lots of things but i agree and it's very high priority i, I think it's yeah. it would make it very cool the hash chain stuff is definitely the one i'm asked most about among my <laughs> weird security conscious uh, uh -huh. software enthusiast friends interesting hmm yeah, we'll have to think about that. Yeah, we'll have a chat about uh, how to prioritize these things when we're done. We're getting there. We're very close yeah. to having the sort of full suite of operations. So I'm, I'm very, oh, yeah, very totally happy. Cool. Yeah. So the last thing is the system graph. Okay, so this is another graph, another graph of graphs. Okay, so actually this one, uh, why do we have a system graph? Well, we have a lot of server stuff. So this is sort of a metadata graph, core server architecture stuff. It includes stuff like authentication, authorization, capabilities, all the users, uh, cores information, uh, database names, and who controls them. So this, this is database names. So they're, they're names of databases, not really layer references, uh, but uh, references to a name, which is the, the name of the metadata graph. Okay, so this is our entry point from some sort of object into the label and then we get the label and then we manipulate it in a more sort of terminus story way with the label. Okay, so why don't we, why do we use names here and a label uh, in the system graph instead of another layer of layer IDs uh, so that we'd have like, you know, we'd have the, the, the graphs, the commit graph, 
the metadata graph, and then the system graph. Well, that is possible. We could have done it all the way from the ground up. However, uh, if you store layer references in a graph and advance, um, if okay, so when you have the label approach, where you have a graph of graphs with the labels, uh, with the layer IDs pointed to inside of that graph, that ensures transactionality when you update the head. Okay, so we could do that on the Terminus store. Uh, we've made it to the, uh, we don't do that because if we did that, then every single database in our system would have contention with the, the system graph in order to advance. Okay, so if we have tens of thousands of users, they would all be fighting for advancement of the head on the system graph, and we don't want to do that. Uh, because we think that, that that won't work out very well in terms of performance. So there's a, the downside of this is that when you do this, you can have uh, many, uh, Wackle can refer to many databases simultaneously in a transaction, but it will only be acid for write to a single database because of this change. So you, you have to be uh, within one of these label uh, graphs for it to be transactionally sound for writes. You can you can have many reads as long as there's only one write. If you're trying to write to two databases simultaneously, it is possible in Wackle to do that, but you won't have the same guarantees. It's possible one commits and the other does not, and then you're in a kind of weird state. Okay. So this is from the top down what the, th the whole thing looks like from 30,000 feet. You see in the upper left-hand corner, there's the system graph, and it has the, the databases with their names. And they, uh, they're the name that's used to get the, the, uh, the label, which gives us back the layer, which represents the head of that graph. So we might get the metadata graph head. And then inside of the metadata graph, we have a local, and that points to a layer ID. And that layer ID is the head of the commit graph. And then the commit graph has inside of it um, a master. And the master points to a commit object. And the commit object points to a instance graph main, which points to a layer in the layer store. And you can see that the, the layer store, you have all the layers. They point to their parents. We have all the commits, they point to their parents, and each of them sort of points in turn. So you can see in the end of this chain, the instance main points to the bottom of this stack of layers. Here we also represent that all of the uh, hierarchy of graphs is also represented in the layer store. So you have the layer store schema head, you have the metadata graph head, you have the ref schema head. All of these different graphs are represented in there. You also see there's a delta rollup. This is how a delta rollup is uh, implemented. So what it is is you have a layer, and there's an equivalence to this layer, and that equivalence points to the delta rollup, and the delta rollup points to its uh, parent if it has one. So that you might have intermediate del delta rollups, or it could be terminal. It could just represent everything up to that point. Then you have an example here of garbage layers. And garbage can I, layers, yes. Can I just ask you a question, Gavin? So you actually have schema graphs internally with all of those different schemas inside the layer store, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's, and so like when slash. you write to the yeah, so when you when you write to the commit graph, there's a schema, there's actually two schemas for the commit graph. There's the layer yeah, yeah. schema and, and the ref, ref schema. Yeah. And those you check all instance updates to the commit graph are checked against the lab, layer schema and ref schema before yeah, yeah, yeah. the transaction is That's allowed to super advance. cool, man. Wow. It is quite cool. So it's like there's this like uh, chain reaction of transactions that take place that are nested. Um, and because of this sort of nested transaction thing, we speculatively write things occasionally. There's like hypothetical situations where you write a hypothetical layer and see if it could survive uh, its uh, constraints. And this means that we end up with garbage layers, potentially. So there are layers in the store that are not no longer referenced by anybody and never will be. Uh, and those, those some, someday, we will have to clean those up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not currently done. 
But the nice thing about it is there's probably a way that the, it can be done by a daemon process that doesn't have to know about the current state of any of the running terminus servers, uh, as long as we're clever. All right? Nice. And I think that sort of wraps it up. That's sort of the main, that's yeah. the whole shebang. So if there's any questions, uh, I'm sure Matthias can answer them for you. <laughs> <laughs> Good speech. Very good. Very yeah, good. Very good. Yeah. Good stuff. Hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully people uh, see this and think, geez, that's cool. Cause yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really cool. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. I like hopefully, the octopus. Uh, hopefully also the octopus. everybody has a bit of a clear picture of, yeah. of what is actually going on here and what all these layers are because, uh, well, we work with this daily. So we got a pretty clear <laughs> picture in our head of how it all interconnects. But I mean, I imagine that not everybody has that kind of picture. Uh, and it's sort of important that, that you do sort of know, like how does all of this work? How is it actually happening yeah. uh, behind the scenes? Uh, so yeah, if there are any questions about this, please, please ask. Uh, even so, if, you, if you think of them later on, ju just ask. It's very important that, that we have some clarity about this kind of thing. Yeah. So I guess one, uh, one key question is, um, as this changes, um, how are we going to evolve the existing databases that people have? That is a yes. huge question and very uh -huh. important. So yeah, we, we're going to need some kind of migration scripts for that. Uh, and we also need versioning. So we need migration scripts uh, just for your local database so that uh, after you upgrade to a new terminus, uh, everything is fine for you. But then, of course, there's an additional problem that all these servers are supposed to be communicating with each other. So they will also have to negotiate some kind of version number and ensure that they don't pull in like some kind of commit graph for a much older version and then they're unable to read that. So definitely there's, there is some uh, thought that still needs to go into that. Uh, yeah. Basically, the answer is just we need to be very careful, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and for that reason, basically, we should struggle completely not to change any of those schemas once we, uh, you know, get to uh, the public launch until we have a solution for that problem. Sure. I, I, I think, actually, you know, these, like, if you look inside these graphs, it looks very complicated with all of the things, but really there's, most of the graphs only have a couple of data structures in them, you know, the commit graph basically has commits and the, the graphs kind of hang off them. You don't have to care about them much. Um, uh, they just give you a commit ID, basically with a, a little bit of uh, metadata about users and authors. You know, they really are, uh, we should uh, strive to keep that design thing of keeping the core uh, data structures here skinny and not mm -hmm. just willy nilly. Like I, I think it's, it's really good that we, for example, that the commit message is only a string. It's got a string and an author string. And mm -hmm. any more structured than that, yeah, put it in yourself, you know, make mm -hmm. an ID code or whatever, you know. Yeah, use a, use a hashtag and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But it means that we're not trying to, we're trying to support the minimal data structures that we need to, to basically keep everything linked together, to keep the octopus from yeah, disintegrating. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah and, definitely. Yeah. But it, it, it would be nice to have a good answer uh, because, of course, you know, when we're the database of record for people and we release yeah. a new version, we want them to be able to safely update and we don't want to yeah. have, I mean, it, yeah. it would be, it would be kind of ironic if, if they're using our database because they're afraid of their own public database, like yeah. my article says, so they, their yeah. production database, they're scared of, um, of, they're no longer scared of migrating their own production database because they're users of Terminus DB and therefore can do everything uh, with yeah, yeah, yeah. Merge. Uh -huh. Except but then, upgrade Terminus. <laughs> yeah, the, the worst thing we can do is trample on people's data that, uh, that, yeah. that destroys yeah. our credibility. So yeah, yeah. we gotta yeah. be very, very careful there. Yeah. We, we do have a lot of ammunition though. We do, we can spot errors if we try and write, you know, bad data in. Uh, but we just have to make sure that we have it in place before we go and uh, change anything that's in broad release, you know, that will yeah. kill our credibility. Yeah, I mean, the, the upgrade pathway for um, for the store is complicated enough, but the upgrade pathway for intercommunicating, collaborating, Terminus TV is more complicated again. 
we yeah. need some way to do automatic conversion and uplift yeah. of, of older. Well, even the first, you know, the first step is is uh, sorry. That's version one. This is version two. It's incompatible. Mm -hmm. Please upgrade. You know what I mean? We don't have to. We but we just have to make sure that we before one before as soon as we create that situation that, that that's possible that we have something in place so we don't destroy people's data, or mm -hmm. or you know. Yeah, that's the key. Exactly. And not, not neither destroy their data nor make them afraid to upgrade to the latest version of Terminus DB for fear yeah, of destroying yeah. their data. Yeah. yeah. So that they get stuck on some old version and then and then we have to support multiple versions of the field and we can't just always push people to upgrade. Yeah. That's a very strong incentive to make sure people have upgrade paths, you know, old versions in the fields that yeah, you can't that, that you can't say, oh just upgrade because your database doesn't support it. That would be a nightmare. Exactly. Yep. Good stuff. Any other questions? We sounds nice. really great. Great. That's great. Thank you very much, Gavin. Right. Thank you. And Thanks, Matthias, Gavin. Thanks, that Matthias. was brilliant. That was fantastic. Great. Really great.